Hello everyone, it's me, Chris Kreicho, with Dan Freeman again, being excellent YouTubers who are amazing at this. We totally didn't just spend half an hour trying to set up our video setup, which is even longer than it took us the first week we were doing this. Good times. Uh, but we're back! And we're going to... Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, um, we're good at this. Like, follow, subscribe, something? You know the drill. Yeah. Uh, today, we're going to continue our deep dive on Glint, and we are going to actually dig into what we promised last time. Mostly Dan's going to talk today. I realized on rewatching the video that I talked a lot last time. People who know me may not be surprised by that. But today, we're going to dig into how the transform layer actually works, how the template DSL actually works, etc. But before we do, we had a listener... Listener? Clearly, I spent too many years podcasting. Uh, a viewer, a viewer, a watcher, a subscriber, I don't know, ask a question that we've got notes on in our readmes and elsewhere, but that I thought was probably worth actually saying here because it does come up fairly regularly and talking a little about it and the trade-offs involved would be helpful. And the question was, okay, in a number of places, we recommend turning off the built-in TypeScript support in VS Code, for example, where we say, hey, go ahead and, you know, you're going to get double feedback. You're going to get uh, inaccurate feedback from the TypeScript language server because TypeScript says, I don't, I don't know what this thing you're trying to import is, but it's sure as heck not a TS file, uh, especially in the case where you're importing GTS or there's just an HBS file there or something like that. And so maybe, Dan, you could kind of walk through some of the stuff we do cover in our readme and then maybe how it relates to like the GTS file extension, et cetera, whether there's any changes there, you know, yeah, the yeah. stuff. So I think you you touched on the high level points and we do, we hit these in the readme, but I totally agree. It's worth talking through here since the whole point of these conversations is to go into more of the technical depth. Um, big picture is the reason we suggest turning it off is the same reason we suggest using Glint at all, which is that TypeScript doesn't understand what your templates are doing. And in particular, where that's going to come into play is things like reporting unused members of a class or unused imports, where if you're only referencing those things in your templates, the TypeScript language server is going to say this is unused and going to flag it accordingly. Depending on your settings, that might just mean that it dims in the window a little, or it might mean you actually get a squiggle that says, no, something is wrong. Um, it also, it does give you double reporting for things like hover information and a couple of other features, which may not bother you, may be fine. Same with the unused flags. Uh, where it does really become problematic, though, is when you start talking about template imports, because TypeScript doesn't know what a GTS file is and will just right. blow up when you try to import one of those. Um, there is a newer compiler option that's designed for sort of working with bundlers where you're importing from files where TypeScript doesn't know what that extension means. But like, if it sees something that matches on disk, you should be allowed to import that. The answer today to whether we can just do that for GTS is, I'm not sure. Uh, I know for a right. fact that there is an open issue on the repo right now about the fact that we don't support doing imports, including the GTS extension, um, which is something that more and more packages are moving to as we have more standards compliant notions of what it actually right. means to do ECMAScript imports. Um, so that at a minimum needs to be fixed before anything on this front can work. It's possible that that in combination with whatever the name of that flag is that lets you do things like import CSS files and stuff might solve this and might allow you to continue using TS server. Um, you'll still have the same issues I talked about before with reporting unused symbols that are actually used in your templates right. and things like that, but it would at least solve the hard errors on template imports imports. Right. Um, the other thing that I think that might help with is uh, if you actually switched your entire code base over to being fully using template imports, template tag, GTS files for everything that has a template in it, then your TS files would not be showing things. Well, no, your TS files would still be showing things from Glint, but your GTS files would only be showing things from Glint. So you'd only be getting double reporting in one place. Right. Um, the other thing, and I probably shouldn't even bring this up, but I'm going to anyway, because it's interesting. Um, 
at least within VS Code, and this is sort of where this is re relevant, mm -hmm. because for most folks using like Vim or something, it's really an either or thing. You're not having to do this thing where you're opting out of the built-in TypeScript mm -hmm. tooling. There are some mechanisms for VS Code extensions to talk to one another. And in particular, it's possible to install um, the TypeScript language service does have a notion of plugins. They're more limited than what we need to be able to do with Glint. Um, Which is why we we'll don't probably, use them for what we do with Glint. We can probably, probably will go into a deeper dive on that, not today, but in a future yeah. one of these, because it did start as a language service mm -hmm. plugin, and we eventually were like, no, this isn't going to work. Um, however, it's possible that we could set up the Glint VS Code extension to install a language server plugin that specifically on files where we noticed that Glint was active, disabled things like the extra mm -hmm. diagnostics that you get from TypeScript and stuff. In principle, that could lead to a much cleaner kind of coexistence between the two. It would probably take a fair amount of work to get that figured out. And there's always the possibility that you might end up squashing real diagnostics. So right. it's something you'd want to be very careful about. But it's it's an idea that's been at the back of my mind since we initially realized, oh, you probably want to turn off TypeScript because the editor as a whole doesn't make that easy to do. You, they really assume that you want to yeah. leave this thing on by default. So yeah. um, that might be something that's worth investigating at some point. Hopefully, people will be a little more um, enabled to go try investigating that kind of thing after this series. But um, yeah, I don't think it ever got anywhere beyond just the, hmm, that would be an interesting idea stage at this point. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks for explaining that. That I think will be helpful to folks following along. So yeah, now absolutely. let's transition and let's look at some code. Scary. So <laughs> Dan's going to drive this week. Um, and what we're going to do here, I think, is, you know, we've got this demo GTS file and we're going to work from here up to, you know, from this very, very small view up to something much more complicated in the end. And what we're going to do is basically just show at each step using some of the debug tooling that is built into Glint, which I only learned about when we were talking about how we were going to do this <laughs> after the show last week. Show? This is a show now, Dan. Uh, mm -hmm. After the discussion last week. But show you, and this will be useful things if you're trying to work on Glint, but it can also be useful debugging like, wait, I'm getting this error and it's telling me what now? Uh, I think... The goal here is that you'll be able to bootstrap a mental model of how the transform works and how the the uh, template DSL works. And along the way, you'll probably understand some more things about the uh, environment because we're going to have to touch on some of those points. But we're going to start in kind of the shiny future slash present world of GTS files. And here, Dan, I will say, take it away. Great. Um... I'm going to go ahead and nothing up my sleeve on this, by which I literally mean I have nothing on my sleeve. I have not scripted out exactly what we're going to talk about here. So as I dive in, Chris, I'm going to hope that you hold me honest. And if <laughs> oh, I, I skip over something that seems important, please call it out. Or if I'm spending yeah. too long on something that isn't important, that too. Um, or if I'm just talking way too long about anything and we need to get moving, that's a very good thing to hear. I mean, that's so. what this whole thing is, right? <laughs> yeah, that is kind of the point, I guess. Um, cool. So we talked a little bit about the TypeScript DSL we had last time that does its best to represent what's happening in a template in TypeScript such that we can use this DSL and have TypeScript give us errors that make sense according to what's going on in the template. Um, what we have in front of us here is possibly the world's most boring template, but it's a pretty good starting point, I think, because there's almost nothing that can go wrong here. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, this is a GTS file. If you're not familiar with that, I'm going to point you toward documentation that Chris will put in the notes on the YouTube video because we shouldn't Down go there. in there on that right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, so here is a basic template. If I were to have done my homework ahead of time and had a server running, I could show you that this <laughs> says hello, but you'll just have to take my word for it. Um, let's see what this actually looks like to TypeScript via Glint. So there is this show IR for debugging command that we have it tucked behind a debug. Like You have to open settings and check a box that says, yes, I want debug features. We probably should get rid of that. Um, nobody should be coding to these interfaces, obviously. But it, yeah. like Chris said, it can be helpful to be able to see what's actually going on in the covers. 
Let so me, let me emphasize I, that. No one, no one should code to these interfaces. They are extremely internal implementation, private API details. We don't expect them to change on any given particular cadence, but we can change them whenever it's useful to us too. They're not public. They're extremely private. So this is for debugging, not for coding too. Yeah. Um, and also as a heads up, when you run this command, it literally just replaces the contents of the editor. So <laughs> don't do this on something that's not in source control or that you're not prepared to go command Z a bunch of times. Um, and on that note, here is, ooh, yeah, this will be oh! fun with a blown up. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and I don't have prettier for template import set up, so this is not going to just format itself. But um, OK, we'll walk through this. This is the boilerplate that we don't have to talk about more than once. So templates, by default, are export default if they're just sitting at the top level. That should hopefully not be surprising to anyone. Um, and then here, right out the gate, we immediately have a lie. And you'll discover that most of this is a series of lies to TypeScript. Yes. Um, here, specifically, what we are doing is we're saying, OK, according to the configured environment, which we'll come back to a little later, uh, in this case, Ember template imports, the entire DSL that we need to describe templates lives at this path. And so we generate an import of, of that path. And we specifically want to call the template expression, because the thing that we had here in source was a template expression. That, in turn, receives a function that takes this gamma thing and this, what is that, a chi, key? Key, yeah, I mean, yeah, chi. <laughs> All my yeah. years of biblical and classical Greek, chi! <laughs> right. But yes, chi. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and that we are casting, at, or not casting, but asserting that that is the same type as the cast we did above of this empty object. And basically what that's doing is giving us a handle on the entire DSL within the body of this function without having to re-emit that import statement over and over. Um, in principle, that's probably pretty fast for TypeScript to resolve repeatedly, but it just makes things noisy and ugly more so than they already yeah. are. So um, the gamma will come back to. Um, and then you see we just emit references to both of those things because otherwise you can get spurious diagnostics that say, hey, you didn't use gamma. And, you're looking at your template, not right example, right? Gamma anywhere. Yeah. Um, so this is pretty uninteresting. It does literally nothing. It's just the wrapper boilerplate. But this is what you're going to see as sort of the outer shell of just about any template component or template uh, that Glint is looking at. So if we back that up, and maybe we make this a little more interesting. Oh, but before you keep going, I think one of the things to note here is that there's nothing between the template tags that is dynamic. Uh, it's just yes. hello. And so when you go back to that transform, there's nothing in there. There's just the gamma and the key, Kai. Uh, however we're going to say it. We'll go with Kai. Um, there's no hello in there because hello is not something that's getting type checked. You can think of it as it sits in kind of the same world as a comment or something like that. TypeScript's not going to see it because TypeScript never needs to do anything with it. So it's not in the emitted transform. It's worth noting, we do notice that there's text there for a couple yes. of reasons. Um, one is that there are places where text isn't legal. Like syntactically right. it is, and then, but it, semantically it's not. For instance, between named blocks, you can have white right. space and you can have comments, but you can't have text. The other is the fact that this is text and not like empty code space like you would have if this, you know, if I, if I oops, went up here and hit control space, I get completions for all of the global stuff in the world. Right. You don't want that to happen in here. And in fact, you don't. You just get VS Code saying, I don't know what's going on in this file. Here are two things that look like identifiers <laughs> that I've seen. Um, and that's right. it. Because none of the active language servers offered anything. They all said, no, there's nothing for me to give you here. So um, if we didn't keep track of the fact that that was text, it would end up just looking like code, and you would get you know, as you're trying to type "hello world," you would be getting completions for stuff, and it's pretty annoying. It doesn't make sense there. Yeah, right. Um, so, let's do that. So, okay, everything's happy. Red squiggles are gone. We have our mm -hmm. type information. Let's see what it looks like. So we have our same boilerplate above and below as before. And we have this new line with mm, technically three function calls. Um, 
And this is all still probably... sitting within the body of that callback to template expression, right? Yes, exactly. So everything from three to six is the template expression body, or four to five is the template expression body, and three to six yeah. is the boilerplate around it. Um, in retrospect, I probably should have started with a helper or something, because those are actually simpler than straightforward things, but we're here, so we'll go forward. <laughs> the fact um, that those are simpler is itself interesting, so I think that'll be useful to come back to. Yeah. So, and this is something that I know there are conventions sort of forming in folks who have been doing work in strict mode templates, but strict mode still does not mandate that you do. I'm going to go back anyway. If this were that, uh -huh. strict mode still allows that. Now that's a helper invocation. Um, and in fact, that goes to the point that I'm about to make about why this is more complicated is because yeah. when we see top level curlies like this, we don't actually know if th that's just some random piece of data that you're emitting into the DOM or if that's a helper you're invoking. Frequently now, I've seen people start to write top level helper invocations like that to indicate yeah. to the reader. Um, but as far as the template itself is concerned, either one is legal. So and in case you guys missed this. that, that was wrapping parentheses, which is I'm immediately yes, invoking know. this full helper. Yeah. yeah, I've seen people put spaces outside. I've seen people put spaces mm -hmm. inside. Neither one feels great to me, but I don't know. Anyway, for now, we're just going to go back and emit a string. And then take a look at what that looks like. So three things going on here. Calling emit content, calling resolve or return. And we're then calling the function that resolve or return mm -hmm. returned. <laughs> so, uh, resolve or return, we can see here that this is resolved to a specific signature of that that says, mm, this is a string. I'm going to give you back a function that returns a string. So, ultimately, we're wrapping this in a function and then immediately undoing that and getting a string uh -huh. back. We'll dive into the details of that in a second. For the moment, what matters is that that, in turn, is going to this emit content call. And for anyone who has run into issues with, like, oops, I have multiple copies of Glint template, or I didn't merge types onto my custom resource write, or things like that, you may be familiar with the top-level content must be of type content value error message. Uh -huh. This is the call that's responsible for emitting that. And if we drill in on this, we can see emit content literally does nothing except make sure that you've passed it a content value. And if we go look at what a content value is, it's essentially the things that you're allowed to stick at the top level of a yeah. template. Strings, numbers, booleans, null undefined, full, safe strings. DOM nodes, helpers can return DOM nodes. You can also just emit them directly. Uh, I'm sure there are ways you need to be careful about like lifecycle management and <laughs> yes. keeping references to bad things and stuff. But like in general, you can emit DOM nodes directly into templates without having to do imperative coding, um, as well as components that themselves don't take any args, those are value, valid things to use at the top level. And maybe one other thing to see here before we leave emit is these are function declarations. There's no body to them because the only thing we're doing here is setting things up for TypeScript to type check. We're never going to execute code here. We're basically creating a pretend world of pretend executions so that like pretend function calls, etc. So the TypeScript has something it can type check, but there's no runtime code associated with it. This is all purely yep. stuff for the compiler to check the types and then use that to give you the feedback. Yep, that's exactly right. If you look over in the left hand here, every single one of these things is a DTS file. There is no actual source here. There used to be a handful uh, back when we had to do re-exports from mm, Ember and yep. Glimmer. And we had to have actual TS there. And we had all kinds of issues with not doing the re-exports properly when you were dealing with like innumerable properties and things. But <laughs> today, all of this stuff only lives at the type level, and there is no runtime counterpart at all. Right. So OK, we understand emit content. Um, I'm going to go talk about resolve, and then we can come back mm -hmm. to resolve or return, I think. That's probably the way we want to play this. So let's make this a helper. Uh, I don't know. Be excited. I'm not going to spell that wrong. Word string. Oh, not a very exciting helper, but be excited. Wow, twice in a row. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, uh, once again, 
No squiggles. Thanks for checking out. Let's see what we get. This looks similar to before. We've got this outer init content. Now, instead of resolve or return, we just have resolve. And the trick here is that we can look at that template and see, OK, this thing that you're trying to emit, you're passing it an argument. Because you're passing it an argument, it's definitely not some piece of data. This is definitely right. something we should understand how to invoke. So we call resolve on that. And then we pass it the argument world. And jumping back really quick, you can see that's passing the argument world is exactly what we were doing here. So what is resolve? The answer to that is essentially the core of what Glint is, uh, not to be confused with Glint core. So <laughs> if we dive in here, uh, yeah, this is a good one to start with. The Ember loose version of this is slightly more complicated. Um, Resolve is a function here with three signatures, mm -hmm. signature overloads, whatever we call those in TypeScript. Um, we have one where the thing you pass it is something called a direct invocable. We have another thing where the thing you pass it is a constructor for something we call an invocable instance. And we have a third one where the thing you pass is a function, possibly nullable, because everything can be nullable in a template, and we all just <laughs> pretend it's not. So yeah. we'll start from the bottom and work our way up, I think. That's probably the most straightforward way yeah. to go here. So basically, this version of Resolve, if you give it a possibly nullable function, it just gives you back a definitely not nullable version of that function type. And if we go back here, we can see that that's what we're using here. We see that it's a function that takes a string and gives you back a string. And so we just give you a function that takes a string and gives you back a string. We then invoke that. And it works basically the same way it does in TypeScript. Um, so maybe here's a question on mm -hmm. that front. Why don't we just write be excited world right there? Yep. Uh, the reason is these other two signatures. In particular, I could do something terrible like <laughs> import helper. That's where that lives. Yeah, probably. Yep. Do this, and that needs to be wrapped up now. There we go. OK, squiggle's gone. Everything happy again. <laughs> Behold, so, a function-based helper mm -hmm. of the old one. And if we go back to the IR, we see we emit the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Something to keep in mind here that is either obvious or really confusing, <laughs> depending on what brain mood you happen to be in at any given time, is that we don't have any type information when we're deciding what to emit here. Um, right. That's obvious in the sense that we're deciding what to emit here so that there right. can be type information. We're making it up. But also, yeah. right. But also, like this whole thing is about types, and we should have types available. So why can't we decide things based on the types? But the answer is the first one. Um, we're doing this without any knowledge of types because that knowledge can't exist until this transform has been done. Right. And right. so we have to emit the same code regardless of whether this is a function or a string or whatever. We can't know even whether this is valid or not. So here you can see that we're using a much uglier version of the resolve signature. And we can go ahead and dive in. And we see that it's the second one. And there are some obvious things going on here and some slightly more subtle ones. Um, we'll talk about the obvious ones first. So at a high level, what this particular signature is looking for is this type is basically anything that is constructible, it can be abstract, it doesn't really matter. Anything that you can put a new in front of and get mm -hmm. a type out that we have tagged with this invocable instance interface. And so if we go back here and look at the definition of helper, the thing that this gives back is this function-based helper type, which itself is a function-based helper instance. So I forgot how complicated this was. This was a bad starting point. We had to do a lot at the end of the day, to this to work. it's a thing that extends the helper class. Uh -huh. um, and why that's important will bring us to the first place that environments matter. Um, many people have noticed that the template imports environment depends on the Ember loose environment and are frustrated by that. But the fact is, the template imports environment requires everything from Ember loose to work. 
Um, in the future, we will probably have an environment Polaris or environment Ember Strict or right. something that handles these things sort of atomically. But ultimately, the template imports environment is sort of a transient hack, mm -hmm. and it's holding a place as things firm up and become more official in the future. So all of that is to say we're about to, I'm talking about template imports and all of this, but we're actually about to dive into the um, Ember loose environment definition. And I wonder, no. OK, I've got to go find this myself. Uh, integration declarations for Ember loose. Hey, got it in one. Boom. Um, so we are looking specifically for this. Um, anytime a Glint environment is active, a bunch of TypeScript declarations get pulled in. This happens implicitly when you're operating under Glint, specifically because of these statements. Uh, anything that pulls in the DSL is going to sort of transitively chain and pull in the rest of the environment declarations. What that means is that these module augmentations get applied to your local types. I need to stop leaving my mouse over things to cover stuff up. <laughs> um, what we've done here is we've said, OK, the helper class, we're not actually adding any fields to it ourselves, but we're saying it looks like the instance side of a helper-like thing. And now's as good a time as any to go look at what a helper-like yep. thing is. Yep. So here's that word invocable again. Mm -hmm. um, to be a something that is helper-like is to be something that's invocable that, uh, we're going to have to talk about signatures now too, <laughs> takes some args and returns a thing. Uh, right. And that takes some args and returns a thing is, I know I said resolve is the core of Glint. Takes some args and returns a thing is the core of Glint because that is what resolve does. Ultimately, resolve's responsibility is taking some mostly opaque value, whether it's a function or a class definition like Ember Helper, and turning that into just a function that behaves roughly the way that thing does in a template. Right. So we should look at what a helper signature looks like, which may not actually be formally defined anywhere. Hmm. Didn't think that one through. Uh, we'll just look <laughs> at invocable args. That's close. On oh, no, we won't look at that. That's complicated. <laughs> OK, I'm just going to type some stuff. I was, yeah. Yeah. So in general. Aside, there are docs that have now landed yes. in a PR about signatures. It's about 2,500 words that covers components, helpers, modifiers, and the idea of invocable in general and what kind of the grand unifying theory we came up with for any invocable thing with arguments, blocks, returns, and attached elements. Uh, so you can look forward to that. I'm also going to record a video specifically about that. So that actually just kind of walks through all the pieces of it. But yes, this is specifically a helper. Here's what its signature yes. looks like. Uh, actually, well, here's what this one's signature looks like. It's something like mm -hmm. this. That, and we can just get rid of named entirely. So in general, if you're watching this video, you probably have at least a little bit of familiarity with these things. But as a reminder, this is roughly what a helper signature looks like. It has some args, maybe positional, maybe named, maybe both, and it has a return type. And in this case, this signature would be what describes that helper. But we can infer a much simpler version of, well, you can see if I mouse over it, that we have inferred a positional name string. We return a string. Named has empty object. I think we've actually gotten rid of that in the upstream Denver types. I think that's gone now. But mm -hmm. for the DT types, or at least the version of them that I happen to be on in this playground package, um, that still exists. But the empty object that I had there is equivalent for all intents and purposes. So jumping back to, we were looking at helper like. Yeah, OK. So get is a helper type we've defined in here somewhere. You can think of it as working essentially like the type level equivalent of ember.get. It looks, uh -huh. sees if the key is present in the thing and you have a fallback. So here we're just saying, get the args key out of the signature and then process that into invocable args, which we'll talk about in a second. Get the return key out of the signature. And if it's not there, we'll just use the type unknown. Return unknown, yeah. So if we go look at invocable args, there's a little bit of type nonsense here that I'm not going to go too deep on. But the gist is that we pull out the positional, and we splat those out. 
And then if there's a named args thing in there, we split that out as the final positional argument. And this is something that's changed a lot over the history mm -hmm. of Flint. Uh, we've moved things around. We've changed the way we represented them. Um, there are a lot of interesting constraints here coming from TypeScript. There are a lot of constraints here coming from things like the way function helpers work. And so we've landed in a place that is not super simple, but mostly works for most cases pretty well. Um, and that is possibly named args at the end, all positional args before that. Mm -hmm. And the reason for possibly named args at the end is that you can write a function helper that is just a function. It's not a quote unquote helper other than it happens to follow these rules where it's a list of positional arguments as just normal arguments, A, B, C, D, followed by an object type at the end, which will be inferred to be the named arguments to it. Uh, if I could go back in time, I, I did the type level shenanigans to figure out that we could indeed make that work. I, re I have regrets. I wish I hadn't done the type level shenanigans to make it work. It would have been a lot cleaner if we had just said, actually, you can have a single named argument blob or you can have positional arguments. Yes, this is not exactly the same as classic helpers, but it makes many things much easier to reason about. But I didn't do that. I did the work to get us here. So here we are. And this way of arranging it makes it possible for us to represent that as well as classic helpers and other things as well. Um, we may see this in a little bit, but things like each uh, are, you probably think of them as helpers, and I think we even document and teach them as helpers, but the signature for each has a yield in it, and helpers don't yield any, like it has a block in it, right? Helpers don't do that. So, but at the end of the day, we still need to get to a thing that has an invocable set of args. Components have that. Modifiers have that. Anything invocable has that. They just have different subsets of things that they're allowed to do. Curly components, uh, kind of classic way you would invoke Ember, could have named and positional arguments. And so at the end of the day, we're going to bottom out right here, exactly like we do for a helper, where it could have named or positional args. Same thing for the modifier type. It could have either. So we're going to bottom out right here and hopefully preserve whatever we've said is named and positional and everything will quote unquote just work. Except for when you hit one of the, I think we've even solved almost all of the corner cases at this point, but there may still be one or two here or there that you can fall off a cliff on. I don't remember if so. I think that's right. I think we definitely struggle in cases where the thing that is your last argument could be some named args mm -hmm. or could just be an under constrained type variable. Mm -hmm. And I think the advice we generally give there is refactor your types because that right. just, there's just too much Thanks going on there for you. <laughs> um, but I do think in general, we've got it into a pretty good place. And we do things like propagate type parameters. Like if you pass in a polymorphic function, you get a polymorphic thing out. That matters mm -hmm. a lot for things like each was the example you just gave. If you give an array of strings, you need to know that the thing that gets yielded is a string. If you give an array of numbers, then it's a number and so on. Um, so jumping. So invocable args. So what we've said is something that is helper-like is invocable with this kind of call pattern. And we've pulled out our args, so it's all of the positionals, and then possibly the named at the end. And then it's the thing that returned, which looks pretty much exactly like what our original just basic function mm -hmm. looked like. Um, invocable. invocable. Ah, he's ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Invocable is just anything that's a constructor for an invocable instance, obviously, Chris. Obviously. And you might ask, <laughs> what is an invocable instance? That's anything with this magic invoke symbol on it. Um, and so when you sort of put these things together, the reason we have convo invocable at the top level is because that's actually what you're typically dealing with is the constructor. Right. That's the class that represents your component or your class-based helper or your class-based modifier or your resource or whatever. Um, whereas the invocable instance is the unusual piece. It's not common that you're actually dealing with the instances as you're passing things around. This right. tends to be confusing for a lot of people. It's very tempting to write like foo colon component X, but you don't pass around instances of components. You pass around the constructor. And so... Yeah. Um, I think adopting Glint is often a lesson in learning where to add the type of operator a lot of the time. Yeah. And that invoke but, symbol, notice again, there's no real symbol here. It's just a declaration of a symbol. And we do this a lot in Ember's types and Glint types. We declare a symbol that doesn't really exist. 
And then we say an invocable instance is something that has this symbol on it. And I suspect this is part of where Dan's headed next anyway, but uh, I wanted to make it explicit. We just write an interface merge that says, hey, Ember Helper has an invoke symbol on it. And that's a lie. It doesn't exist at runtime in any way, but it allows us to carry around critical information about the type and its relationship to these other types in a way that only exists for compile time. This is very close relative of the idea of phantom types, which you'll sometimes encounter a little in TypeScript, but often in other languages, where this is exactly what you want to do. You want to track some information at compile time, but you don't want to pay for it at runtime. And so you use this kind of thing where you have, in our case, a symbol uh, that says, here's the, the type I am and that I carry it along, but it doesn't do anything at runtime because it doesn't exist at runtime. It's purely a type-only construct. And the nice thing is it's sort of a vacuous lie because you can't mm -hmm. prove we didn't put something there with that symbol because you can't get your hands on the symbol because it also doesn't right. exist. Right. So, um, a vacuous yes, to Chris's lie. point. <laughs> I think Hopping that'll be the title for now. this episode, A Vacuous Lie. <laughs> I like it. So we said an invocable is a thing that constructs an invocable instance. An invocable instance is something with that symbol. And so if we work backwards here, if we say the instance type of a helper-like thing, that's exactly what Chris just described. All of this is a higher angle bracket way of saying, hey, helpers have this invoke symbol on them. But by doing it this way, we don't need to know the details of any of the internals we just talked about. Right. Anything that basically functions like a helper in a template you can declare to Glint that it is like a helper in a template by doing this. Um, and this we called this out in a few places. This is the recommended method if you're going to do not yep. quite public, but like public-ish things to extend Glint and make it understand your custom managers. We dog food this. We don't do with maybe one exception, which is contextual stuff, which I'll get to later. Um, we don't do any internal type munging in these integration declarations. We just use right. the instance side of these public types. Which means that, for example, Ember's own types, This is we talked about this a little bit last time about working really hard to keep the coupling low about at places where things may need to have kind of different rates of change or different shear layers, so to speak. Ember's own types that define helpers and stuff, they don't know about any of this. They have a signature then they use and they supply the right slots and then glint comes and wires those up and uses them. But there's no point where Ember says, ah, I declare myself to be a helper like thing. It just says, here's the shape of helper in a way that can be declaration merged so that glint can come along and have exactly this code right here on lines 60 and 61 and 62 to say, okay, that thing that is the default export from helper, it works with these types this way, the end. And that's it. Ember doesn't know any of the things about it. And there's no coupling there other than, hey, there's a signature type. And here's how you should write your signature types. That's the entire level of coupling there. That's really important because it means that we can evolve these things separately over time if and as we need to. And it's part of how we were able to even get to the point where we could do this. Because if we'd had to bake this all into Ember itself, oh, good grief, we'd, we'd finish sometime <laughs> in 2046. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Um, so popping back further, um, we have an instance of the helper class. So delete that. I'm just going to have to go through the undo stack later or whatever. It's fine. Um, anyway, also, so we've resolved. We've covered a lot of stuff. Everything isn't going to take us this long, everybody, because a lot of this is going to be reusable. So don't panic. This is not going to be a four-hour Most... long video. I mean, if only because we're definitely stopping before then. <laughs> Correct. Um, so if we look at the result of this resolve call, we can see it is a very ugly thing. Um, <laughs> TypeScript couldn't recover specific things like the names of args and stuff. But like the gist is it takes a string as its first argument, and it can optionally take an empty named args object. And we'll talk a little bit more about named args mm -hmm. specifically later, because there is a subtle distinction there between, oh man, I'd forgotten about this. Uh, for function-based helpers that expect named args as their last argument, it's legal to 
pass an object as a last positional argument or to invoke them with the special named arg syntax. Mm -hmm. And we needed a way to allow you to do that for function helpers, but not allow you to do it for things like this right. ember helper helper. Um, because it is, well, we can, if we go back far enough, we can show you uh, way too far. Okay. Um, if we make this take, oh, uh, let's do this. Okay. So right. if we turn word into a named argument, then we can invoke this this way by passing named arguments. We cannot invoke it by just passing a hash object as the final thing. Oh, I have to import hash. Where does that live? Ember helper. Thank you. Which means the... Not to be confused uh, with ember component helper. I was going to say, the import above it seems really weird now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is this giving me... Oh, we're angry. Why are we angry? Precisely oh, we're giving a, of, yeah, it's doing the right thing. It's just there's a lot the of error is less awesome in between. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the key bit is actually this line that I highlighted in the move past, which is we're saying word string is not assignable to type named args word string, and that is specifically machinery we've put in place to account for this situation where right. at runtime you can't invoke this by passing. A hash at the end. It has to be special named arguments. And so and if the you reason look at for the way that is then the at runtime putting hash there would invoke that helper with a positional argument that was an object. And so right. boom, it like you try to use word there and it's undefined and it is not what you it is not what you want. It would show up over there in an object instead. Right. So we show the IR. Um, most of this should look familiar. We're emitting content, we're resolving be excited, we're passing word world, and then we're splatting this named args marker onto it. And this is, I mean, we can go look at what it is. It's not very exciting. It's, oh, that's clever. I forgot I defined it that way. <laughs> um, yeah, so if we actually look down here, this is the bit that matters. Named args marker is just a thing that has this named args symbol on it. You'll see this pattern a lot. Familiar we hack. invent yep. symbols out of whole cloth and then say, OK, we're going to tag objects with it to say that they're special. And so here, when we say something is named args t, we're just saying it's that. And also, it has the named args marker on it. So jumping back up here, when we splat this out, this gets us that magic named args symbol, which means that we have validated to TypeScript that, yes, we are passing this as named args. This is not just a regular object. Um, this still works with regular function-based helpers, because they don't care if you splat an extra symbol in there. Right. Um, and in fact, specifically because of the fact that we're splatting it in there, rather than doing something like name parts. Right. If we do it directly, TypeScript will yell about uh, excess properties because we're passing a direct object here. So TypeScript structurally typed it generally doesn't care if there are excess fields on your object, because that's the whole point of structural typing is, does the shape match? Cool, we're good. You can have extra stuff on it. I don't care. You gave me the minimum I care about. But if you do an object literal in line, like we're doing here, TypeScript says, you're passing me things explicitly that aren't part of the signature I expect for this object. That's 99% of it's not the time. That's a mistake. And for the 1% of the time where it isn't, it's fine. You can write let foo equals the object on the line above it and pass it. But almost always when you're doing that, it's because you're just explicitly trying to construct an object that matches an options bag or something like that. And so it's basically hand wave, but basically always wrong to pass an explicit object with extra properties that the type doesn't expect. So they put in excess property checking to account for that. And we slap Splatting this marker back out that. to unaccount for their accounting. Yeah. <laughs> Things we've had to figure out along the way. Yeah. If you want to get good at the TypeScript type system, <laughs> try to figure out how to do things in Glenn. <laughs> um, OK, so I think we've covered enough to talk about resolve or return. Mm -hmm. So let's just do, let's stop undoing it, just delete things, and it'll be faster. You can just do that even, and I think we'll still get what I want. 
No, we won't. Oh, yeah, because there's no resolution happening. No. Right. Fine, we'll do the extra work. Okay. So here we go. We're back to resolve or return. Uh -huh. Like we said earlier, this pops up in cases where you just have single identifier in curlies, and we can't tell if this thing is a value or a helper or what. So if we go look at resolve or return, very helpfully typed as, <laughs> it's resolve or return. What do you want? Specifically, it's typed in terms of the type of resolve, uh -huh. because different environments are going to have different signatures for resolve, but resolve or return is always just that, plus one extra thing, which is if nothing else matched, and TypeScript evaluates function signatures in order. So if we ever get here, it's because nothing else matched. Then this is, in fact, just treat it like a helper that returns a value of that type. And so we take you, and we just give you back arrow you. So this is a thing I haven't looked at in a while. And what you just said, Dan, is that because T is going to end up being the never type in that scenario? And never and something else is something else, or what? What it is, is that function overloads in TypeScript are secretly also basically intersection types. They are just ordered intersection types. And so you can uh, add yep. an extra signature onto a function by just giving it one more function type. And so the way this, <laughs> every environment used to type resolve or return by make resolve work, copy, paste, add that final clause. Mm. And eventually, as we these signatures changed so many times in the early days of Glint mm -hmm. that there were bugs because we'd forget to update something, or it was also just really hard to read because it was the same information twice and it's super dense. Right. And finally, I was looking at it and dreading having to go through an update. Ember Loose used to have like eight signatures on Resolve. It was terrible. I think we've gotten rid of some of those. I think we're down um, to six. Oh, that's not so bad. <laughs> I want to see now. Uh, this one probably. Three. Oh, no. We only have three. Wow, look at us. It, oh, yeah. well, there's resolve for bind. That's actually where <laughs> some of the nastiness that's, that's, went. Oh, well, that's the part I was thinking of. That's. I promised last week that when we got to the types for the component helper, everyone would suffer for it. And this is where the <laughs> suffering lives. <laughs> anyway, in the meantime, uh, resolve or return is just the type of resolve with a fourth signature smashed on that says, like, if this actually isn't something that you should be able to invoke, that's fine. Just pretend it's a helper that returns the value. And so that's the way we get to when something is just a string. We looked at it before. We said, OK, this just returns a function that returns string. And so that's the same as a helper that doesn't take any arguments. We invoke it directly. And the right type kind of shakes out of all of this. An immediately invoked function. Yay. Right back to script 3 and trying to avoid <laughs> global variable leakage. And yeah. Poof. OK. So that's Let's... Mostly. That's top level helpers. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also do things like div class equals. And let's see what that looks like. Ooh, uh, some fancy new things different. here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh oh. I knew what this was called when I picked it, and I don't anymore. It's a gamma, Is that a right? It's gamma? A yeah. gamma? Yeah. It's a little gamma. Oh, yeah, that was on purpose. I thought it was very cute that it was a lowercase gamma because it's sort of a local version of the big gamma. Mm -hmm. OK, good job, past Dan. <laughs> Where gamma is the context, as we'll get to. the Yes. Yeah, man, we haven't even gotten to components yet. Just you wait. Uh, Your minds so. will be blown. <laughs> or at least you'll know what this funny upside down L means. <laughs> so. so here, we've got a couple of new functions that we've Oh, no, resolve or return is right there. OK. Uh, we've got a couple of new functions that we haven't seen from the DSL yet. The first one is this emit element. And if we look at it, we can see that it's doing roughly what you would expect it to do without mm -hmm. even having to dive into the type gymnastics. We give it the string div because that's what we see in the template. And it says, OK, that's an HTML div element. And so gamma here is just the contextual, like, this is the type of the thing you're working in. Um, and if you'll notice, all of this takes place inside uh -huh. a block. And most people probably aren't used to seeing bare blocks like this in JavaScript. They are not super common. There's not a lot of reason to use them other than let and const only are scoped within their block. 
So what we're essentially doing with these two lines is saying, okay, everything between these two braces is dealing with stuff going on in or below this div. And then we immediately introduce, here's our little local environment that we're operating in. Specifically, this is for our div. And then we do some stuff to it. Specifically, in this case, we're applying some set of attributes to it. Uh -huh. We're immediately pulling out the element and saying, okay, that's an HTML div element. And then we just treat it as a hash of values. Class was the name of the attribute we were passing in and world was the value we were passing in. This and is the exact same. Is the exact same thing, yeah. Right. That's, this is the exact same expression that was inside the emit content value before, only now it's being used inside apply attributes instead. And you're going to see this pattern over and over, is that any time we have curly braces or parentheses where it's like, OK, some kind of resolution is happening, you're going to see a resolve or a resolver return get emitted. And then that gets used in some outer context, like being passed to an attribute or emitted as top-level DOM content. Uh, that wasn't so painful. That's all there is to know attributes. about attributes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's actually kind of an, an interesting function. Mm -hmm. uh, all it really cares is that it receives something that looks like an element, which it would be very difficult to construct something that didn't in this context. But you could. Um, in particular, if you try to pass attributes to a component that does not declare an element in its signature, ultimately apply attributes is going to be called with like null or unknown or something uh -huh. here. Um, the other thing is that we care that the values are adder values here. And this is something that looks a lot like a content value, but is slightly simpler. Um, in particular, you, you, you can't, can't pass set a DOM nodes as attributes. Or, you can't, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, it's really just like primitives or safe strings. And we don't allow void, which makes sense, but I'm surprised we made that distinction. Um, so that's all apply attributes is doing. It's fairly straightforward. But if you and then that means that of... we're not trying to type check uh, when it comes to element attributes. We're not trying to type check. For example, if you look at HTML ordered list element, HTML O list element, what a great name. Uh, that has attributes that are allowed on it. That mm, a more accurate way to say this that have an effect on the behavior of it that don't have an effect when you apply them to HTML U list element. And so you could imagine a world where we try to capture all of those semantics. In practice, that's not really how HTML works. Like if you put uh, reversed on an OL, it's just not going to do anything. And so, yep. and also the work that's involved in capturing all of that is very high and the reward is fairly low. Uh, you're better off if you want that kind of thing, building a design system that has like a V list and an H list and takes ordered and things like that, where you can actually give real semantics to it. HTML has semantics, but they, they tend to be at sufficiently low levels and also with lots and lots of unions and overlap and everything else that in our case, it's just not worth trying to capture all of that. And also there's a lot of real world HTML that would fail this validation immediately if we did that, because people just do stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's less of an issue from a type checking point of view than all the other kinds of things we're looking at and talking about here. Yeah. So there is a subtle distinction here that I don't actually remember how this changes the output, but I think it is worth noting mm -hmm. because it is different to set an attribute directly than it is to use it within a string mm, that gets yep. passed to an attribute. So let's see if I've just made trouble for myself. Ah, okay. We do... It's not unreasonable. I'm not sure it's gaining you much. We're basically we telling TypeScript, hey, this thing is getting stuck into a string. Um, and as long as TypeScript thinks that's OK, which for interpolation, I think almost anything goes. Yep. Um, like symbols will blow up if you try to concatenate them with a string, but I don't think they blow up if you interpolate them. No. You'll get a warning yeah. about it that says you should probably do the string coercion from TypeScript, but that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, this ends up looking very similar. And just like Chris called out before, where we didn't emit hello at the top level because that's inert from a programmatic perspective, we also didn't emit it as in this class string here. We only care about the bits that are actual code. Oops, that's not what I wanted to press. So uh, while we're talking elements, let's do this. Man, if only someone would implement auto-import for GTS. 
dear listener, dear viewer, I keep all my podcasting dates, dear viewer, it could be you. Auto import could totally be you. I should be clear that I was saying that with tongue in cheek. It's probably yeah. our most requested feature. And in principle, the lift is not enormous. Um, Chad did a ton of work to support mm -hmm. uh, auto fixes and completions in general, or auto fixes and completions in general. Mm -hmm. What's lacking is the support for auto fixes in completions, which is to say, mm -hmm. when you're typing and you're asking TypeScript for some amount of type ahead, why is there a yellow? What does that mean? In the top right there, it's been there for a while. No, stream is reduced <laughs> quality. As long as you can read what I'm doing, that's probably fine. Yep. Um, my brain just went off on a complete tangent. Oh, right. <laughs> we are at the almost thing that's the hour right mark, now. so once we get yes. through modifier, we'll probably call it, and then we'll do the deep dive on component and really break everyone's brains yeah. next time. That sounds good. Um, oh, the point about autocomplete is that it's they can either come as a request for like just general code fixes in a static mm. file, or as you are typing and asking the language server for, hey, any suggestions here? Code fixes can be attached to those, and that's the way yeah, auto yeah, import yeah. actually functions in every that makes sense. Yeah. version of the TypeScript language server. So what we need to do is support code fixes that are attached to completion items, because then, and I think we also need to tell TypeScript that we want import completion items because those don't come on their own. Um, but then what that means is that you will get a suggestion that's like, hey, you want modifier from ember modifier, and when you pick it, the associated edits to your file will also be applied. Right. Meanwhile, uh, let things. <laughs> I love it. I am, yeah. Doesn't matter. This is good to start with. Mm -hmm. So, type checks. We haven't insisted on very much, but it does type check. Let's see what it looks like. Uh, once again, we have our friend init element, and mm -hmm. once again, we have our friend resolve. But a couple of things have changed. Ooh, we have a trailing comma there. Fine, but I didn't know we did that. Yeah. yeah. Um, here, modifiers work a lot like helpers, but not quite the same as helpers. Let's actually stop and look at what type we got out of this. Uh -huh. So when we resolve a modifier, we get something that I moused away from. Uh, takes an element as its first argument, and then some other args. Oh, I guess we didn't explicitly say we didn't want positional args, and so we're just getting sort of an arbitrary number here. Right. It's not ideal, probably, but fine. Uh, and then we just get this opaque modifier return. And under function-based modifier, extends modifier, ah, this is what I want, integration declarations. Here we can see we've done exactly the same thing we did with helper. Mm -hmm. We're pulling the instance type off of modifier-like, modifier-like. Here we can see where that signature came from. We say, OK, modifier signatures have an element field, so we got to pull that off. And then we're using the same invocable args thing to take the right. named and positional arguments and spread those out, and those are the rest of what it takes. And then we have modifier return, which you will be shocked to see <laughs> has a magic symbol on it that we have set to true. So all this is is just a token that says this thing was successfully invoked as a modifier. So if we pop back up, this now makes a little bit more sense. You can see, OK, we emitted the element. We got a div. We're passing that as the first argument. We are sticking a comma there, but not passing anything else. And then we're handing off the result to apply modifier. And based on what you might remember from apply attributes, you can probably guess about what apply modifier looks like. All it's going to do is verify that the thing you gave it successfully returned modifier return. So if you try and invoke a helper and use that as a modifier, right. that's going to return some non-magic symbol value, and you're going to get a type error because you tried to use the helper as a modifier. We can do things like insist that this takes uh, an HTML audio element. Oh, there, that autocomplete worked. Um, and you'll see we get a squiggle here because we've passed it an HTML div element, but it mm -hmm. wanted an HTML audio element. Um, you can get away with declaring the wrong element 
more often than you might think, because in fact, a lot of the HTML element interfaces look the same. Um, Structural but typing. For the yeah. But for the fancy ones like video and audio or anything that has any kind of programmatic interaction, uh, you will get proper errors, which from a structural perspective is what matters. So yep. uh, that's modifiers. We've covered those in helpers. Components are definitely a class of their own. Fortunately, yeah. all of this resolve, mod resolve machinery that we talked about here, that applies to components as well. There's just some stuff on top of that. So we've got the good groundwork, but um, yes. I think probably descending into how components work is going to be its own video. Huh. Which, I mean, that seems fair. There, There's a lot there. Named arguments and attribute application and named or unnamed blocks and the things they yield out. And one of the things we didn't cover today, but that we'll see some more next time that components give us a good hook for talking about is how some of this works to do keep carry along type parameters. We alluded to this with each, where if you each over an array of strings, you want the item that gets yielded at each spot to be a string, right? We'll go into all the mechanical details of how this kind of stuff works next time. You can see that it's an instance type of component-like, just like I alluded to earlier, and there are some shenanigans going on here to preserve all of that. Though this one isn't actually bad. I've written worse component-like helpers myself. Um, but that's been a good intro, and I hope people have a good sense of how the DSL works. And also, you can kind of start to get a mental model of the transform, the relationship between the environments and the transform and the DSL. It's hard, but it's like the way I summed it up last time was it's it's hard, but it's mechanical. And you can see the kind of mechanical transformation in the kinds of things we saw today. So any closing comments on your end, Dan? Ooh. Uh, no, I don't think so. Look forward to components. There's lots of fun stuff going on there. We started yeah. with components in the initial design and then kind of worked mm -hmm. backwards to helpers and modifiers and stuff and discovered what these things had in common. Um, in retrospect, I mean, that worked fine. It got us to a place where I'm pretty happy <laughs> with the design. But like, we did pick the hard thing and did it first. So. Which in some ways is great, because then when we got to the other ones, we were like, oh, it's got this other little edge case, but that's fine. We already got the yeah. hard bits. Thanks so much again for making the time. And thank you all for watching. Uh, mash that subscribe button or uh, like hit it with your elbow. That's today's challenge. Hit the subscribe button with your elbow or whatever. This has been Vacuous Lies. Was that the, what was the full title? It was. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, Vacuous Lies. Yeah. Uh, that's the type strip story anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks for watching, everybody.